I usually use this uh, line uh, for Jim's keynote address, but um, Jim really doesn't need any introduction. He is the master investor himself, sometimes compared to Warren Buffett. And I think I'm right that I can hear the helicopter blades whirring. So that must be Jim arriving imminently. Please await the arrival of our chairman, Jim Mellon. Thank you very much, Victor. It's lovely to be back in person with so many familiar faces. And I'm sorry that I'm not dressed at my best today, but my shoe delivery failed to turn up on time, so I'm wearing trainers. I'm not going all trendy or trying to get down with the youth of today. It's just that there's been a bit of a, uh, a snafu. Um, I, as you know, this is three years since uh, we all met. Uh, those three years have been absolutely tumultuous for many of us, very difficult, uh, very scary. And just after the pandemic ends, of course, we get plunged into this appalling war, uh, which has roiled markets and again caused concern uh, for the people of Ukraine and also for us uh, as investors as to what to do to protect uh, and grow our money. And so today I'm going to try and keep it simple and tell you what I'm doing, what I recommend. Uh, not everything I recommend, as some of you will know, comes right, but some of it does come right. Uh, and I hope uh, I will inspire you to look into uh, some of the things that I'm talking about. Some of the companies I'm going to talk about are represented here today, and I encourage you to go and visit them on their stands after this presentation, if you've got time and the inclination to do so. Before I get into my talk, however, which is on the transition to a new investment era, because that's what we're going into, and everyone needs to take account of that, every one of us has been touched in some way by the pandemic. We've all known people who've suffered badly from COVID, or indeed who have unfortunately succumbed to COVID. One of the great friends of Master Investor over the years, one of the best investors that I knew, uh, and a dear friend of ours who came to visit us with his wife in Ibiza many times over the years, unfortunately died in the last few months from COVID. His name was Alan Steele, and it's, I just want to take a second to memorialize him with the approval of his wife, because uh, he was a regular constant participant in these shows. And it just goes to show, and I'm sure everyone in this room has got someone they'd like to memorialize, that it's been a terrible time. And then we go from one very good man to one thoroughly bad man, uh, and the implications of what he and his henchmen have done in the last few weeks. I don't need to tell you how awful the situation in Ukraine is, and I hope everyone in this room is doing what they can to support the Ukrainian people. It is, uh, I'll just go back very briefly on that one. It is the case, however, that from every crisis, uh, there is an opportunity, and I'm not saying this in any way as to dance on the grave of the many Ukrainians who've been killed, but we as investors have to look at opportunities in the context of the world that we live in. And that's what I'm gonna try and do today. But it does also go to show there's no security. You know, we cannot be secure in any investments. And just to put this in perspective, uh, all the investments in Russia, or more or less all the investments, have been mandated by the various central banks to be written down in funds to zero. So there you could have been a few weeks ago with shares in a big Russian company, and they're now valued at zero. There is no security. There are only degrees of security. And it's for that reason that my macro outlook will give you some comfort as to places which are more secure than others and where we should be looking uh, to invest our hard-earned money. I have to say that no one, and so don't believe them if they tell you they do know because they don't know, knows what the outcome of this war will be. But I also want to tell you 
that this war has actually crystallized or galvanized trends that were already in place. In other words, the war itself hasn't caused the so-called tech wreck. It hasn't caused the high volatility in precious metal prices and in other metal prices. Uh, it's just provided a focal point, if you want to put it that way, uh, for investors to take stock of their portfolios and to readjust. It is the case, as I will show you in a second, that the technology sector, which was so overhyped in the US and which in 2019, I was warning people to stay away from as much as possible for the very overvalued shares that were there then, uh, has actually produced a complete train wreck. That's not necessarily shown up in the indices as much as it has in individual stocks. I also told you that I thought bonds were a very bad idea because we were going into an inflationary period. We were going into a period where there would be some tightening by monetary authorities around the world, and indeed that is happening. And I'm going to tell you again, stay away from bonds. We're in a period, as you will have heard from other speakers today, notably on the uh, Will Frost panel, which I thought was outstanding, and I recommend you have a look at on the replay, that we're going into a period of rising interest rates. It's an inevitability. Uh, and those interest rates could rise quite surprisingly high. The underlying inflationary trends that I pointed out in 2019 have now come to the fore. And every central banker will tell you that they're transitory, that they're not here for the long term. They just represent the culmination of stuff that went on in the pandemic and so forth. And that's just not true. We're now, for instance, in the United States, seeing service price inflation which is a very bad sign. It's understandable that goods price inflation would be around at a time of rising commodity prices, but we're seeing the beginnings of endemic inflation and worse, inflationary expectations, both in bond markets and in the general population. And so we have to do something to protect ourselves against this incipient and pernicious inflation. Just think of it this way. If inflation in the UK peaks this year at 8%, which is very likely, and you have £100 on the bank earning nothing, because that's what you get in bank accounts these days, more or less nothing, at the end of the year, your purchasing power is only 92. So it has a very direct effect on all of us as savers and investors, and we need to adjust our portfolios accordingly. The reason why stock markets have been buoyed up over the last 20 years or so, 25 years, is largely, in my opinion, to do with the incredible increase in the balance sheets, particularly recently, of central banks around the world, where novel monetary policies have been applied in the form of quantitative easing, in the form of outright monetary printing, in the form of huge loans made to all sorts of sectors of economies, ranging from the United States all the way to China. That monetary uh, balance sheet expansion, sooner or later, in my opinion, had to show up in the form of inflation. And so it has. It just took this one horrible event, uh, plus the pandemic, for it to uh, crystallize itself in the way that it's doing now. And it's not going away anytime soon. The central banks, as some prescient commentator this morning said, are running behind the curve of the monster that they have created in terms of their balance sheet expansion. So you can see the MSCI World Index tracks very, very uh, closely the in increase in G4 central bank balance sheets over the period of the last 25 years or so. As those central banks begin to tighten, and they are beginning to tighten, they have to tighten, what is going to be the effect on the stock market? Well, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be great. So adjust your portfolios accordingly. You can see the US central bank has raised interest rates in the last week or so, first time since 2018. They've signaled another six raises uh, in the next two years. There'll probably be more than that. I would expect that interest rates in the US will rise to at least 4%. In the UK, you're going to get the same increases in interest rates. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the European Central Bank has produced a more hawkish statement than people expected. I think it's a mistake in Europe, by the way, because Europe has its own unique set of problems. It's a mistake for them to be tightening at the moment. But nonetheless, they look like they're going to tighten. In the United States, 
uh, 18 months ago, you could get a long-term mortgage for about 1.5% fixed. Today, the cheapest mortgage you can get is 4%. So the pace of change in interest rates is remarkably fast. And take note of it in the disposition of your portfolio. Also take note of the fact that only a year or so ago, SPACs, you may have heard of SPACs, were all the rage. Anything to do with technology, the technologies of the future were all the rage. People were paying not P-E ratios for stocks, they were paying multiples of revenue or potential revenue. This company's cheap because it's only two times revenue. That one's not so cheap because it's five times revenue. It was sheer madness. It was the lunacy of crowds. It was tulip bulbs all over again. And sure enough, what we now have is a tech wreck in the United States in particular. Uh, it, that's why the UK market has performed relatively well, because we don't have a big tech sector in the market. Now, let's look at this. The main NASDAQ constituents, 43% of them, are down more than 50% from their highs. 20% are down more than 75% from their highs. You may have heard of ARC, the funds that are run by someone called Kathy Wood, who believes that she has the hand of God on her and is m managing money for his purpose. And ARC stands for the Ark of the, uh, the Ark of a Testament, I think, or something like that. She was up 152.7% with her $60 billion in the year 2020. All of that, all of that has evaporated. All of that. So those people who like momentum investing, who jump on bandwagons where prices seem to go only upwards should take note. They don't. There's always a reckoning if you don't take account of the fundamentals. Uh, and now, Berkshire Hathaway, the Warren Buffett uh, company that's been, I wouldn't say plodding away, but compounding away for a long, long time, she's has caught up with her, has caught up with her. So the old style of investing over the long term is probably the better style of investing for the bulk of people's portfolios. Some of these stocks have just, they look like, I mean, they look like the side of Mount Everest, the downside of Mount Everest. You know, stocks like Netflix or Peloton, the stocks that uh, were so popular in the pandemic, people were all on their Peloton bikes, they were uh, watching Netflix, we were as well, uh, we're all on Zoom calls. I will be very glad, by the way, when Zoom calls come to an end. I really don't like them at all. Uh, but we've been living that life, and look what's happened to these stocks. They've cratered. Some of them are down 90 95%. Now, looking uh, forward in terms of growth, it's quite clear that the U.S. is actually running too hot. The U.S. economy is really uh, booming compared to other economies around the world. It has its own particular set of characteristics, one of which is, of course, that the monetary, uh, the monetary expansion in the US was so great. It was absolutely enormous. And the amount of money that they lavished on basically everyone in the United States, because they sent out helicopter money checks to individuals in the US during the pandemic, was absolutely incredible. So what you're seeing as a US economy that's too hot uh, and is taking, uh, it, it takes the lead in terms of monetary policy around the world. And you're seeing Europe, for particular reasons of its own sclerotic nature, of the Ukrainian debacle and fundamental mismanagement by the ECB, you're seeing it uh, in probably close to recession today. So you're getting a very divergent look at the two major blocks outside of Asia Pacific. And uh, it's, not a, it's not a very good look in either respect. In the US, um, the Russia-Ukraine conflict doesn't have a huge direct impact on the American economy. Sure, the price of gas, as they call it, or petrol, uh, has gone up. But America is self-sufficient and has been in energy since they started fracking 15 years ago. Um, and so it's not going to deter the Fed from tightening. And indeed, they, Jerome Powell has indicated that they will be tightening. That's not good for stock markets. It's particularly not good for wrecked areas of the stock market because there's no capacity for them to bounce. And remember, if you buy something at 100 and it goes down to 25, it's a lot harder for it, go, for it to go back to, uh, to 100 than it is for it to go from 25 to 100. Because at every point, as the share price goes back up, 
there are sellers who bought at every price point on the way up. And so you have a continual flow of selling into these tech rec stocks. So don't think there's going to be a rapid recovery in the US tech sector in the relatively near future. But the balance sheet of the Fed is contracting. Our interest rates they've signaled are going up. They'll go up a lot more than they've signaled. Uh, bonds in the United States are, um, if you can short bonds, are a, an absolute outright short. And you should certainly not hold bonds in the US or indeed, in my opinion, more or less anywhere else. So what do we do? Well, in 2019, I banged the drum and I told people to buy gold and silver. Very volatile uh, commodities, but commodities that do their job over the long term of preserving your wealth. Now, I believe that gold and silver are there to be effectively rented. You don't want them in your portfolio forever because they carry a negative yield. It costs to hold gold. It costs a little bit, but it nonetheless costs to hold gold. It costs to hold silver. Sure, there are gold miners that produce dividends, and I'll talk about a couple of those later on. But effectively, gold is a, both a hedge and also an investment that should be in and out of your portfolio. But it should certainly, and since I banged the drum in 2019, I'll tell you today, I'm mega bullish on gold. It's up 60% since 2019, but it's got a lot further to go. I have a, a very good friend and business colleague called JY, who was very early into crypto. He has a huge amount of money in crypto, and he now believes that gold is going to go hyperparabolic. So we're just under $2,000 an ounce today, as you will all know. And he thinks it could go to three to $4,000 an ounce in the next 18 months to two years. And I believe that that is absolutely possible. At that point, we will reassess the situation as to whether we sell or not. But heck, in an inflationary environment with a commodity that's proven its worth over thousands of years, why wouldn't you own gold? Why would you try and finesse the purchase of a US tech stock that's down on its knees and may never get up off its knees? So keep on holding gold and silver. The US dollar in this latest crisis has been relatively strong, but it may not remain so. And I'm going to posit this to you. First of all, the US uh, has multiple problems, but one of them is not uh, its position vis-a-vis uh, -vis world currencies. The US has what's called the exorbitant privilege of having the world's reserve currency. But it may not be the world's reserve currency forever. There may be something going on that we should take note of. I have no truck with what Russia is doing, but their foreign exchange reserves, which numbered or number $650 billion, they thought would be sufficient to take them through any rainy days, presumably including this war that they've started. But what's happened is with a stroke of a computer keyboard, half of those foreign exchange reserves have been sequestered, have been frozen, because they're held in US dollars and other uh, central banks which are not very friendly towards the Russians, to say the least. So even if you think you've got a big rainy day reserve, it's entirely possible that it could just be taken away from you. And so wouldn't countries such as China, which have much bigger reserves, they have a trillion, one trillion dollars worth of US government bonds, or Saudi Arabia, be a little bit suspicious about what might happen to their forex reserves, which are held in dollars, if suddenly the US regime turns against them. That's one of the reasons why central banks are beginning to move out of US dollars into alternative currencies, including, I should say, the renminbi, which is becoming increasingly popular as a currency of commerce, particularly uh, in the Asia Pacific region. So I would, if I was in your shoes, and that's what I'm doing, not say, oh, the US dollar's strong, I better have a few of those. But I would look at the broader macro picture and say, maybe I should diversify out of US dollars and think about other currencies. And the ones that I recommend to you are the British pound, believe it or not, because I feel that our country, I know that our country is doing much better than most people suppose, and will continue to do better than most people suppose, contrary to some of the lamentations you may read in the popular press. The Australian dollar, and I'll talk about Australia a little bit, 
The Canadian dollar, which is a, another currency that's related to commodities, and the Japanese yen, which has been remarkably weak, but may, in the next year or so, strengthen considerably. So those would be the currencies that I would have my money in. Now, you can see that in the US, the debauching of money is actually leading to a significant reduction in the real purchasing power of the US dollar, which is another reason why we should consider moving out of dollars. In the last uh, 20-odd years, you've seen US dollars as a percentage of foreign exchange reserves around the world, very importantly, fall from 71% to 59%. I think that figure could go below 50% uh, within a few years. And at that point, the exorbitant privilege that the US dollar has begins to lose its luster and its power. So it's something that US should think about because they may not be able to print unlimited amounts of bonds and sell them to foreigners forever. We are in a very dynamic period of change in terms of currencies. As far as Europe is concerned, let's put it this way. The UK this year will probably grow in excess of 4% in GDP terms. I would be surprised if Europe grows at more than 1%. It has so many problems to deal with at the moment, including, unfortunately, uh, a huge influx of refugees. Um, it's got surging inflation, but more or less everywhere has got surging inflation. It's got declining growth, as I just said, and it's got financial instability. Do you know that last month the, U the European Bank Index was down 35% in one month? Why is that, do you think? It's because European banks have big exposures, big cross-border exposures to Russia and other countries in the Eastern European area, which are going to cause them significant problems. So 35% down in banks, which are supposed to be solid shares, is an indication of the financial problems that the European Union has. Now, we know, if you look at this football on the side, that Russia is an insignificant part of the world economy. It's tiny, even compared to the UK, Germany, France, and Italy. Uh, and it's minuscule compared to China and the US. But what Russia does have, as everyone here will be familiar, is a pretty big share of global oil exports, and particularly of exports to the European countries, not so much the UK, but European countries. It's a huge exporter of natural gas. It's the second largest in the world exporter of natural gas. And Europe is highly dependent on uh, European, sorry, Russian-derived natural gas. That's causing both the prices to surge and major problems for Europe in terms of how does it deal with this situation. Does it keep on paying for Russian natural gas and thereby uh, em embolden Putin and enable his horrible war? Or does it cut off natural gas and allow uh, its citizens to uh, basically be without heat, without cooking, and so forth. It's a very big problem. And as you've seen, the price of natural gas has gone through the roof. It's off a bit now. And then, of course, there's the food issue. And this will get to one of my main themes today, which is Russia is a big exporter of fertilizer or the components of fertilizer, such as ammonia and potash, to Europe and the rest of the world, as well as of wheat. Price volatility in food has been absolutely remarkable in the last couple of months. And food prices are going to go up sharply uh, around the world as a result, causing some serious difficulties for major populations around the world. We need to reduce our dependence on volatile uh, commodity foods, and we need to reduce our dependence specifically on Russian uh, commodities that go into the production of food. Let's turn to China very briefly. It's a country, as we all know, of contradictions. It is the only country where the momentum of credit, the impulse of credit, is improving and not deteriorating. Uh, and this has happened at a time when China has, in some ways, actively been trying to destroy its own or sectors of its own stock market. You know, the tutorial sector, the education sector in China, was a, a pretty big sector. It amounted to about $50 billion dollars. Uh, just a year ago. Now it's about $5 billion because the Chinese said that education should be free for one and all. And so obviously commercial education companies didn't really fit into that paradigm. You've seen the same thing happen on social media companies in China. You've seen a lot of Chinese government interference 
in the workings of the free market. Nonetheless, given that Chinese stocks have been absolutely decimated, I see a couple of pickup points there, much more so than in the United States, because China has now sort of changed its mind a bit, and you're getting an increase in monetary uh, policy. Uh, so you could see some opportunities to make some uh, relatively short-term gains in Chinese stocks, and they will feature at the end of this presentation. I still like Japan. I think Japan is one of the world's best-ordered societies, maybe not from a monetary point of view, because all their monetary experimentation has come to naught over the last 20-odd years, but there is definitely an improvement in corporate governance going on. Companies are learning the meaning of buybacks, dividends, and other uh, tactics used by Western companies to improve their share prices, and they're presenting a better face to foreign investors. So I would absolutely have some portion of my money in Japan, and we'll recommend some uh, Japanese investments for you as well. Um, the Australian uh, situation is rather positive. Uh, Australia is one of the world's largest uh, commodity exporters. There are some Australian companies uh, represented here today. Uh, it's a beneficiary of all that goes on in China, and it looks to me like a safe haven for investors at the moment. So I would absolutely look for some Australian exposure as well. And I mentioned already that the UK, which a guy in his brilliant speech that was before mine, who runs the Mercantile Trust, was talking about, it's the, one of the cheapest markets in the world. And what we have in our markets, which includes quite a lot of commodity producers, quite a lot of basic industries, not a lot of technology, a lot of domestic industries, looks pretty good. Dividend yields are good in the United Kingdom. Uh, the companies are, for the most part, pretty good. And I would recommend that for the first time that we overweight our own country in terms of our asset disposition. I'll just give you one example. I mentioned it about a year ago in a master investor letter, which was by Lloyds Bank. Lloyds Bank is a com completely domestic bank, has no exposure overseas, doesn't have an investment bank with all the volatility that attaches to that. It's dominant in many parts of the UK financial market, and it sells at 0.7 times book value. I estimate it to be on a prospective dividend yield of 7 or 8%, and its PE ratio is probably around 7. I like the look of Lloyds Bank. It may be a bit of an old uh, dinosaur in terms of its management, but you, know, you can't really go wrong by holding Lloyds Bank as a I talked about security. It's one of the more secure things that I can think of with upside in the stock price of possibly 30% over the next couple of years, which will do us all fine. That's one example. I think the UK is quite cheap. Now, uh, you know, I've been banging the drum for gold for a while. Conviction idea number one uh, is gold this year. Everyone should have 25% of their portfolios, gold, silver, or gold, or silver proxies, or other metals. You will have seen the nickel market in London had to be suspended. Trades had to be canceled in the first time in its history in the last 10 days or so because of this huge speculation uh, about nickel. The same, I'm not saying that gold, the gold market will freeze up. It won't. But I'm saying that you could get a hyperbolic reaction in gold and silver prices, and you must be positioned accordingly. Um, you, we all know about the energy shock and oil price surges. It's because we can't meet the demands of COP26 and the net zero agenda without incorporating the need, especially with the Russian situation, to have some fossil fuels in our portfolio between now and then. And I'm really interested in the energy transition, and I'm going to talk very briefly about that in my remaining uh, 11 minutes. We've got uh, here Larry Fink, the chairman of the biggest fund management company in the world saying, forget about search engines, forget about media, forget about uh, you know, everything else. Let's look at green agriculture, green energy, uh, look at other parts of the world and the world's opportunities, uh, because yesterday's technologies and yesterday's stories that have been wrecked in the great train wreck of 2021 and 2022 are gone, mostly gone. Of course, there will be some that are terrific, but most of them are gone. 
Let me give you an example. Apple Computer probably is in either your pension fund or maybe in one of your portfolios. Great company, dominant in so many ways, but Apple is selling now at more than 20 times earnings. How fast can Apple uh, grow to justify that PE ratio? How many new products can it develop in a world of so many super smart people and startups? I don't know, but I don't think Apple is something that we should own in preference, for instance, to Lloyd's Bank at the moment. So my three long-term investment themes, some of you will be familiar with at least a couple of them, are as follows. The energy transition, and my colleagues, Denham, Anthony, and so forth, who many of you know, and I are working on a very new initiative. You know at Master Investor, we believe in democratizing investment. We believe that everyone, not just the big institutions, should have the opportunity of participating in the dynamic future technologies that are going to make us so much money. That's why we floated agronomics as an example at five, and today it's just under 20. Uh, that's why we floated Brad Ahead, uh, which I founded, uh, and that's up from five at the flotation, only a relatively short space of time ago, to over 15 today. That's a lithium company, obviously very key to the energy transition. And that's why we are going to do something directly in energy transition, so watch this space. Then there's the future of food. Many of you will, I saw a lineup outside Anthony's stand for agronomics. It's a super exciting area. I can't tell you how exciting uh, the world is uh, in terms of food and changes going on in food at the moment. Please have a look, go and talk to Anthony and team. And then of course, longevity. My long-standing friend and colleague, Greg Bailey, will be speaking later this afternoon um, on the subject of juvenescence and longevity, and I urge you to go along to that. In terms of energy, what's interesting me at the moment, and Alan Kerr, another great friend of mine who's in the audience over there, uh, rightly points out that uh, nuclear fusion, which has uh, been the sort of coming thing, a bit like Brazil for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, may be the coming thing for the next 10 or 20 years. I disagree with him because I think it's a, a thing that's going to happen much faster. And nuclear fusion is very well represented in the UK. And in fact, uh, uh, I think it's called Tokamok, uh, and the Jet Center at Oxford uh, recently produced a sustained uh, amount of energy production for a very short period of time, but at more than 100 million centigrade. Uh, I am going to actually, uh, once I finish my current book, which I'll tell you about as well, I'm going to write a book on uh, the transitioning energy scene because I just think this is a super exciting area, and I want to bring a vehicle that everyone in this room and others can participate in uh, to take advantage of this key change. So please watch the space and look out for Master Investor notices on that. You know, as yet, solar, wind, and all the stuff that we have been reading about and seeing um, for the last 10 years or so is still a very small part of energy. We're still very dependent in this period on gas, coal, unfortunately, uh, and, of course, on oil. Uh, and so nuclear, which represents a clean alternative, particularly and safe now that with the new technologies is something that we should be spending a lot more time on, and you should all be looking at having nuclear representation in your portfolios. In terms of food, you know, because I spoke about this just before we all went into lockdowns and so forth, about how food is going to be made in labs, food is going to be made in brewing processes, and it's happening now. I'll give you an example. In the United States, company Perfect Day is now selling its way in casein products in the form of milk, in the form of components for uh, cheese and so forth, which are bio-identical to cow's milk, but no cows are involved. They're bio-identical. They're exactly the same thing, but the dairy herds don't come into play in them. One million customers in the United States have already sampled these in the last few months. Starbucks has it on its menu now. In 10 years' time, there will be no conventional large-scale dairy herds anywhere on the planet. That's how fast this is happening. In 20 years' time, at least a third of the meat that we eat will be produced in labs. At least a third. And all the companies that Agronomics is invested in have products today. The question is scale and price. The scale is going up and the price is coming down dramatically. This is going to change the way that food is produced. 
Nearly a third of all global greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture in one form or another. If we want to really solve the energy crisis that faces us, this huge crisis, one of the ways of doing it is to reduce the intensive farming of animals. At any one time, there are 10 billion animals sitting on the planet waiting to be slaughtered. 80 billion animals are eaten every year by human beings. Two trillion fish. Today, you can produce fish in labs. You can produce all types of meats in labs. These meats, the chicken meat, are on sale in Singapore. Uh, they're on sale in Israel. It's here and now, and agronomics, uh, for the first time in my career, is right at the front of the open road of this revolution. So please go and talk to Anthony. And then, of course, dairy I mentioned earlier, made by precision fermentation. Pet food. There's a company represented here by the wonderful Owen Ensor called Good Dog Food. And that will be the first company, we think, to have a cultured meat product on sale in Europe. The first, all right, and we've just, you're the first people to hear this, and it will be in the Times on Monday, but we've done agronomics as the backer of it, have done a deal with the Roslin Institute, famous for Dolly the Sheep, uh, to produce chicken meat for dogs in laboratories, and, and cats, by the way, no discrimination there. This is our dog, Juno, one of our seven dogs, and she is going to be featuring in a book that I'm writing at the moment for children about how we need to change our, uh, our way of, of producing food. Uh, and Juno will also be featuring in a song. So she's going to be a very famous dog by the time that we speak, hopefully very famous dog by the time that we speak next year. The last major theme is longevity and juvenescence. I urge you to go and listen to Greg's speech. He actually lives the life of the juvenescent person. He, I don't, you have to ask him about his regime, but it seems to work very well. This is not Greg, by the way. Greg looks very different to this. Um, and uh, uh, th what's happening is for the first time, the science of longevity is catching up with the aspiration of all of us to live a healthier life, especially towards the end of life, and to live extra years. And I can tell you, it's happening now. You all know about the, the mice that have been treated with senolytic drugs, but there's so much that's going on. Our own organ regeneration company, Ligenesis, is in the clinic now in a phase two trial to regrow organs in situ in the human body. It's absolutely incredible. Happening in, uh, in uh, Boston, in the United States. We have juvenescence, some consumer products now on sale in the United States, led by Metabolic Switch, which is absolutely foul tasting but will do you a lot of good. And if you ask Greg nicely, I'm sure he'll give you a scoop of it. You can try it out. Um, and of course, the rich billionaires who want to live forever keep on selling their products to us forever and ever and ever in their cardboard boxes, led by Jeff Bezos, have recently put $3 billion into this field. So as money comes in, the science advances, and the prospect for all of us, and particularly for the very youngest people, I saw a baby here, to live to 110 or 120 are absolutely becoming apparent. So let's look, energy transition. Let's look, food revolution. Let's look, juvenescence and longevity. We have three meaty, tremendous themes that we're living today that should be represented in our long-term lock-away portfolios. And on the subject of portfolios, here's a few examples of stocks that I would recommend to you. In terms of fossil fuels, I mentioned we should own them. I don't, I don't believe in coal. I think coal is a pernicious and terrible thing, particularly in the way that it's mined in, for instance, Germany and in China. But you know, our big uh, uh, oil companies, Shell and BP, are doing the right thing. They're transitioning. Um, they're also self-liquidating trust with enormously strong cash flows. I don't think they'll be hit by windfall profit taxes. They shouldn't. They've got strong dividend yields. Uh, and I would make them an essential part of portfolios. In terms of gold, you could look at Barrick Gold Corporation. Uh, it's got a nice dividend yield. Uh, you could look at the gold trusts from iShares, the ETFs. Um, they're effective ways of buying gold. Um, dark mining, which was talking earlier today, I have, like the look of that. And I also, of course, uh, love what Mark Child has done with Condor. He's got it shovel ready now. And it's, in my opinion, dirt cheap. 
um, and definitely worth looking at. And Mark is at the back of the, uh, he's got a stand here, as indeed has James from Dart. In terms of um, buying uh, nuclear, Cameco, Canadian company, uh, has, is the world's largest producer of uranium. There's a Kaz Kazakh company called uh, Kazam Tomprom or something like that. Next Gen, Sprop. These are all um, representations of how you can buy into the nuclear area. Our own company, Brad Ahead, which we floated, is has got tremendous reserves of lithium in America, which is where it should be because the Americans want to have it on their own territory. And I would recommend that you might want to look at that, even though it has done very well in stock market terms, I think it's got a lot further to do to go. Of course, defense is a, a no-brainer. Here's some defense stocks for you in the UK. Uh, Rolls, BAE Systems, and Babcock would be my recommendations. And by the way, I'm going to give you an email address at the end of this, so if you want to get these slides, you just email the address and you will be sent the slides. Uh, in banking, uh, the banks, the British banks, look really good compared to European banks. American banks look good too. Uh, banks do well in periods of rising interest rates. If you'd like to look at a minnow bank, uh, but one that has got big aspirations, go and look at Manx Financial Group that's got a stand at the back. Uh, and then, of course, there's our own agronomics in China, Tencent. And I really like uh, Dubai, which I think is fast becoming a new Hong Kong. Um, and if you want to invest in the Dubai property market, MR is by far the best uh, of the property developers there. And there are two listed companies that represent it. Now, I think we have to be optimistic in Master Investor, but heaven's sake, you know, make your investments, buy stocks, be cautious, be diversified, do all the stuff that I'm trying to do. Uh, don't worry about a nuclear war, because if a nuclear war does happen, you won't need the money, right? So, um, Final reason for optimism, and I get back to Alan Steele, who I highlighted at the beginning of this presentation. Alan was insouciant, a bon viveur, but a really smart investor, and he knows that the only way longer term to make money is to invest in equities, because it represents the accumulated efforts of human beings. That's the only way to make money longer term. And we can see that since 1981, the average real income on this planet has gone from $2 to more than $7, so things are getting better. There may be crises on the way, but things are getting better. When I see you, and see all of you, I hope, next year, I hope to have some more good news to impart, and that this awful war will be over, and that we'll have made good money by reallocating our portfolios into the major themes of the next 20 years. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen.